And naturally, uh, this is a sort of fiasco, as would be obvious, if you were to ask your wife, do you really love me, and she were to reply, I'm trying very hard to do so. <laughs> You see, the difficulty of it is this. You cannot teach a selfish person to be unselfish by any means. That is to say, whatever a selfish person does, whether it be giving his body to be burned or giving all that he possesses to the poor, he will still do it in a selfish way of feeling. And uh, he will be able to do this with extreme cunning and marvelous self-deception and deception of others besides. But the consequences of fake love are almost invariably destructive because they build up resentment on the part of the person who does the fake loving as well as on the part of those who are its recipients. This is why foreign aid, the foreign aid program has been such a dismal failure. <laughs> Now, of course, uh, you may say that I'm talking in a very impractical way because you, you would say, well, do we just have to sit around and wait until uh, we become inwardly converted and learn through the grace of God or some sort of magic how to love and in the meantime do nothing about it and conduct ourselves as selfishly as we feel. There is, as a matter of fact, something to be said for that. Because... The, the first problem in the whole of this is honesty. And the reason why the Lord God says at the beginning of things, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind, is not because the Lord God is stupid, but because he's very clever. That uh, which appears to be a commandment is actually a challenge or what in Zen Buddhism would be called a koan, a, a spiritual problem. Because if you exercise yourself resolutely in trying to love God and or your neighbor, you will find that you get more and more tangled up. You will realize increasingly that the reason why you are attempting to obey this as a commandment is that you want to be uh, the right kind of person. And obviously you want to be the right kind of person for your own reasons. And so if you do, in the first place, feel selfish and come to the conclusion, as a result of trying various experiments with love, that you love yourself more than anybody else, the proper thing to do is to investigate your self-love, to find out why you love yourself and what you mean by yourself when you say you love yourself. For the reason is this. Love is not something that is a sort of rare commodity. Everybody has it. Existence is love. But uh, it's like water flowing through a hose. It depends in which direction you point it. Uh, so everybody has the, the force running. And maybe uh, the, for, the, the way in which you find the force of love operating in you is that you have a passionate like of booze or ice cream or... Uh, automobiles or good-looking members of the opposite sex or even the same sex. But there is love operating. And uh, people, of course, tend to distinguish between the various kinds of love. There are good kinds, such as divine charity, and allegedly bad kinds, such as, uh, in quotes, animal lust. But it should be understood, I think, that they are all forms of the same thing. But they differ in rather the same way that the colors of light, of white light, divide into the spectrum when passed through a prism. So we might say that the red end of the spectrum of love is Dr. Freud's libido. And the violet end of the spectrum of love is agape, the uh, what is called divine love or divine charity. And that in the middle, the various yellows, blues, and greens are friendship, uh, human endearment, consideration, uh, and all that sort of fellow feeling. But it's all the same thing. And so, uh, the thing is, first of all, to get it moving. To 
follow whatever kind of love you have in the first place. Because you cannot control love until you have some to control, until you have it running. You've got to get your car running before you can learn how to drive it. You will not become a skillful driver by sitting at a still car in a garage any more than you will become a skilled dancer if you simply never move your arms and legs. And so the, the first thing then is to discover what indeed you do love, if anything, and you will find there is something. And then go into the nature of that. Now it's said that selfish people love themselves. I would say that that is really a misunderstanding of the whole thing because yourself is something that is really impossible to love. There are various reasons for this, but one obvious reason is that loving oneself is as difficult as kissing your own lips. Oneself, when you try to focus on it, to love it or to know it, is oddly elusive. It always slips away like uh, the pursued tail of a dog who is trying to get hold of his own tail. So to pursue your own end has some difficulties about it. <laughs> <clears throat> if you explore what you love when you say you love yourself, you will make the startling discovery that everything you love is something which you thought was other than yourself. <clears throat> Even if it be very ordinary things such as ice cream or uh, booze, uh, in the conventional sense, booze is not you, nor is ice cream. It certainly, it turns into you in a manner of speaking when you consume it, but then you don't have it anymore. And so you look around for more in order to love it once again. But so long as you love it, you see, it's never you. When you love people, even however selfishly you love them, uh, because of the pleasant sensations they give to you, still, uh, it is somebody else that you love. And as you inquire into this, as you follow honestly your own selfishness, many interesting transformations begin to come about in you. One of the most interesting transformations of being directly and honestly selfish in the same way that, for example, cats are, is that you stop deceiving people. <coughs> A great deal of damage is done in practical human relations by saying that you love people when what you mean is that you ought to and you don't really. You give the wrong impression and people begin to expect things of you which you are never going to come through with. We have been taught, for example, that we ought to love our enemies. Now, we don't really understand what it means to love our enemies. We think it means to be charitable towards them in the hope that we will convert them and so that they will cease to be our enemies. Uh, the, the real reason for loving enemies is that one needs enemies. They're terribly important to you. For example, I think that some of you here feel that you belong to a nice set of people. Uh, it may be an ordinary kind of bourgeois uh, coterie of pleasant squares, or it may be a church group of some kind, a club, uh, or a special cult, or uh, just a group of uh, friendly drinkers. But at any rate, you feel that by virtue of membership in this society, you belong to a special in-group of nice or saved people. Now, when you consider what nice people talk about when they sit around the dinner table and have an opportunity to nurture their collective ego, you will find that the most fascinating topic of conversation is the nasty people. <laughs> how awful they are, what dreadful things they do, and what is it all coming to? And uh, this very, very satisfactory, condemnatory conversation nurtures your ego. But people who do that don't seem to realize that they thereby depend on the nasty people in order to know that they're nice. They are, as a matter of fact, highly indebted to them. <laughs> 